Welcome to the USC Master of Professional Writing Program Graduating Student Reading Marathon Day One. Yes, yes, it's very exciting. I, I don't know if people had a chance to see this. It's in um, yesterday's USC Chronicle on the back page, which is just as interesting and important as the front page. There's a, an article called Reading Away the Hours, written by our own Nicole Perkins, also known as the woman behind the camera. And um, this is about today and tomorrow's readings. For the first time in its 39-year history, the Master of Professional Writing program at USC College will conduct a student reading marathon showcasing graduating student writers. So, and, and then there's a reprint. That your names are listed, and there's a reprint of this beautiful poster that Scotty did for us, also acknowledging Scotty's artwork throughout the semester, for throughout the year, for all of our, all of our, our, our readings and events. I also want to point out to you that there are some of these postcards on the back table. This is the first time ever that there will be a Thai American uh, writing event held. And it's here at USC, um, organized by uh, Prince Gamalvilas and Penn West. And it's uh, called Customs and Departures, an Evening with Thai American Writers. So if you're around this summer, we would love to see you. It will be a lot of fun. It will also, we'll also have um, uh, a reception. And by the way, my name is Bridget Mullins. I'm the director of the program. <laughs> And um, before we start, I just want to acknowledge some people in the audience who have been so wonderfully helpful. Um, Rakina Joseph, who's in the back in the yellow shirt. <laughs> Rakina is our reading series coordinator along with um, the wonderful Tom Rastrelli. Um, Ebony Cunningham, who is our outreach and diversity coordinator. And, and just sort of Uber Ebony, she's just, you know, she does it all. Nicole, who will be taking photos. And I'd like to introduce some of our faculty. We have Jerry Lachlan here. Um, we have Dinah Lenny, and we have Coleman Huff. So, great to see you guys. So, um, what we're doing today is we're reading, you're reading, and um, we're going to be going in quasi-alphabetical order. And welcome to the families and friends. And um, we all look forward to meeting you afterwards at the reception, which is in Taper Hall. And we can all walk over there as a group. But we have a, a beautiful reception for you after the reading. Um, so, so, and thank you to the family, families and friends uh, of our writers, because we know that that's, that's where they get a lot of their support. It's a really hard thing to be a writer, to be an artist, as you know, and it takes that kind of mutual, sympathetic, passionate understanding of the undertaking to really be able to do it. So thank you. Um, the great thing about writing, as many of us know, and about reading your work in public is you start to realize how nothing's ever finished, and it leads to the next project, and you know, you get seized with these ideas even as you're reading. So, um, you know, it sort of breaks all the barriers that can sometimes be there when it's just on the page. Also, we have this wonderful community at MPW and this audience of each other. And um, Gandhi once said that writing itself is an experiment with the truth. And this has been sort of a, a lab of experiments this past couple of years for our graduating students. Um, so by way of just saying a couple of words about each reader, um, I'm, I'm, we have four readers today, Sarah Kate Fieber, April Davila, Corey Madden, and Laura Sari. And uh, Joey Damiano couldn't be here today, so we just have our, our four, four women, four powerhouses. And I'll introduce each of you uh, between the readings. So our first reader will be um, Sarah Fieber, also known as Sarah Kate Fieber. And um, Sarah grew up in Wilton, Connecticut uh, with her parents and three brothers. She attended college at Yale University where she double majored in English and in art. And she's currently living in Los Angeles and writing fiction. And I can remember reading Sarah's application when she applied to the program and just being thrilled and blown away as we've all been in her time here. Her thesis collection is called White Walls. And it's a collection of 10 short stories with titles such as the Poetry Lady, Chasing Flies, 
and French toast. And I just thought I'd read a couple of the opening lines from the second story in the collection, which is, you know, there, there's this humor and um, uh, focus throughout the work and, and close looking and close seeing. And, and uh, so this is the opening of Chasing Flies. Fruit flies have invaded my apartment. I don't understand why they would want to live here. I live alone. I do not buy a lot of groceries. The fruit I bought yesterday is sealed inside my refrigerator. Drosophila melangostar, dark belly dew lover. That's their scientific name. It sounds poetic, actually. But they are too small for me to see if their bellies are actually dark. And they do not seem to seek or to enjoy dew. My apartment has no dew. I venture down the hall and share my problem. Someone tells me that fruit flies are good for the environment. Not my environment, I say. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Fieber. the intro. Um, I've never done one of these before, so I'm excited and nervous, um, but I'm really happy to be here and to have my family here, so thanks. <laughs> um, I'm reading from the first story in my collection. It's called The Poetry Lady. A day of perfect weather is hard to come upon. There are usually some in May and June and a handful in September, but that's about it. The summers are too hot. The winters are too cold. There's really no contradicting that. People say they like New York City because it has all four seasons, but I have never actually encountered someone who does not complain about some component of the weather, about sweating in a suit on the subway during the month of August, or exposing only his eyes as he pushes against the assault of snow in January. I believe that people who say they like all four seasons here are fooling themselves. They do not actually like them. They like the idea of them, the picture of snow-covered streets and carols the image of a rooftop pool and ice-cold drinks. But in winter, the streets are muddy and silent, and there are about 10 buildings in all of Manhattan with rooftop pools. You're too old for the city, says my shrink. Move to the suburbs, start a family, settle down. I'm only 38, I say. Oh, well good, you're younger than you look. She leans back in her seat and smiles at me. Her lips are crumpled and dry. You still have time. I'm about to ask her time for what, but she tells me my session is over. The following day, I have lunch with Brad, my old college roommate. Brad has big hands with dark hair on the back. People used to call him Bear. I'm running out of time, I say. I take a bite of my sandwich, apparently. For what, says Brad. He has bits of cilantro between his teeth. I wonder briefly if I should tell him, but I would feel awkward pointing out exactly where he should dig in his nail. I shrug and tell him it's not clear. So what, he says. Your shrink told you that or something? I nod. Forget it, says Brad. She, wait, what's your shrink's name again? I stare down at the crust on my plate. I don't know, I say. Well, whatever, she's full of shit, you're fine. Brad smiles at me, revealing even more cilantro. You're young, man, don't worry so much. I am not all that young. I have already been divorced twice, well, almost twice. Carol and I still need to sign the papers. I do not feel like a double divorcee. Maybe because the first girl, Bobby Garrity, didn't really count. We got married a week after graduating from high school. Kyle Spector, my best man, took me to the Zebra Club, the local strip joint, for my bachelor party, and he paid the doorman 50 bucks to let us in. Three weeks later, Bobby and I got divorced. She was on her way to California to study English, and I was on my way to Brown. Irreconcilable differences, we said. One of my friends, Jason George, went to college with Bobby and used to provide me with updates on Bobby's courses, extracurricular, extracurricular activities, boyfriends, it was the perfect situation because Jason and Bobby didn't know each other. He could get close, listen in on her conversations, walk by her room, anything, and she wouldn't think twice about it. I wonder if I will care who Carol dates next. I wonder if I will ask someone to watch her for me, to satiate a desire to know every little detail about her life. But then again, I already do, almost. I know that she presses snooze exactly twice every morning before work. I know that she flosses every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The odd days of the week, she calls them. Tuesday and Thursday are even. What about Saturday and Sunday? I asked her once. What do you mean, she said. Are they odd or even? She looked at me with narrow eyes as if I were insane. Neither, she said sharply. The weekend is just the weekend. I do not think I will keep tab tabs on Carol. The lawyer is doing it for me. 
Carol wants the china, he says, okay, and the record collection. This makes no sense. The record collection was mine. I accumulated the records before I even knew that a Carol Upland existed. We added to it a bit during our marriage, but not much. The record collection, collection was 90% mine. The record collection is mine, I say. She wants it, says the lawyer. I look around his office. My lawyer has a lot of things. The shelves are all full, full of books, sculptures, plants. The walls are covered in plaques and paintings. I wonder if his wife would want any of these belongings if they were to get a divorce. I wonder if he would give them up. This is so complicated. I lock my fingers and push out my arms so my knuckles crack. What are you talking about, says the lawyer. You don't have kids. This is nothing. I have begun to drink warm milk with vanilla syrup. I drink it from a glass, not a mug. I have decided I no longer trust what I cannot see. Plus, the color of the drink is soothing. They say warm milk makes you tired and syrup makes you more awake. I wonder what milk to syrup ratio would be needed in order to achieve total equilibrium. So I remain precisely as tired or awake as I was before I consume the drink. I need an alternative to warm milk and syrup. My shrink makes a note in her notepad and adjusts her glasses. Why is that? It's summer, I can't drink something hot. Mm-hmm, she says. Then she stares at me as if I'm supposed to continue. I begin to feel awkward, so I look out the window. It is one of those days that is hot, even though there's no sun. The sky is dark and low, hovering just above the buildings, spying on the people who walk the streets, sucking the life through their skin. Have you tried drinking it cold? asks my shrink. Well, I say, I've prepared the drink and then added ice, but then the ice melts and the drink becomes watery. I pause. It's not the same. The shrink rests her notepad on the table and leans toward me. What if you didn't heat the milk in the first place? Her voice turns slow and soft. Leave it cold, then add syrup. That way you don't need ice. She speaks to me like I am a child. I feel like a child. Right, she says. I nod. Then the shrink sits back in her chair, picks up her notepad, and writes something down. That night, it is especially hot. Carol gave me barely any time to find a new apartment, so I could not properly investigate my building before I moved in. It was nice enough during the winter, but now the air conditioning is undergoing repair, so the summer has been even more miserable than usual. I plug in my computer and type Bobby Garrity into the search bar. About 6,000 res results appear on the screen. I decide to text Jason George, where's Bobby Garrity? While I wait for, wait for a response, I sit on the window ledge and press my cheek against the glass. Usually it is cold, but tonight it is not. Someone in the apartment building across the street is extending her head out the window. I press my knees to my chest and squint. The woman can see me. She keeps pointing like she is trying to get my attention. She points, retracts her arm, then points again. I wonder what she wants, how long she's been watching me. I slowly peel myself off the window ledge and slink lower so my body is hidden below the sill. Now I can look carefully without the woman across the street looking back. She is still pointing, but there is no way she can see me now. Then I notice something, a flicker of orange falling through the air, and the woman closes the window. She was smoking a cigarette. She did not see me at all. Hours later, Jason George decides to reply. Last I heard, she teaches English at Columbia. I thank him, then immediately look up the address for Columbia University's English department, 1150 Amsterdam Avenue. I don't normally head up that way. The Upper West Side is the armpit of the city. Not as nice as the Upper East, not as trendy as Soho or the Village. Some parts have the old city charm. Exposed brick, low-rise buildings, newspaper stands, dive bars. But the streets are dirty. It seems as though Upper West Siders have trouble curbing their dogs. I am contemplating the best subway route from my apartment to Columbia when my phone vibrates again. Another message from Jason. Aren't you married? I do not respond. I hide behind Kent Hall, my back pressed into its brick facade. There is probably no need to duck behind cor corners. The campus is a swarm of students and faculty, but I don't want to take any chances. To my left, on Amsterdam Avenue, lies her building, Philosophy Hall. Once the crowd dissipates and classes are in session, I let myself in the back entrance and begin the search for her classroom. Every time I hear footsteps, I fear it is Bobby. Every time the red oak tree outside taps against the windows, I think it is her, strumming her nails, waiting. On the third floor, I find it an office with a plaque reading Professor Garrity beside the door. Professor Garrity, not lecturer, lecturer or even associate professor. I do not understand how people become so successful. I wait for her outside on the corner of Amsterdam and College Walk. I want to see what she looks like, what she's wearing, what car she drives, where she goes. I already know she's not married. Her maiden name is on the plaque. I watch the sky turn dark and the trees turn to silhouettes. Bobby has still not surfaced. 
The campus is quieter now. Only a handful of students sit on the uneven lawn. The grass by the oak trees is overgrown, unkempt, but the middle of the quad is littered with bald spots. The only other person beside Philosophy Hall is a middle-aged homeless woman with dark skin and a floor-length skirt. She's been here all day. She doesn't look homeless. She sits up straight, chin tilted upward, and recites poems. The only reason I know she's a beggar, not a teacher, is because I saw students dropping coins in her palms. The poetry lady, says Greg, my coworker, the next day. You haven't heard of her? She's one of the famous ones. You know, like the cat woman downtown, the man with one leg by Grand Central, the crazy bitch on the corner of 59th and Park. Greg takes a sip of his coffee. She's like a New York City landmark. I roll my chair into Greg's cubicle and rest my elbows on his desk. So she just sits there all day reciting poems. Greg types a few numbers into a spreadsheet, then presses the X on the upper left corner of the screen. Yeah, pretty much. I look across the office. Everyone is quiet, working. Everything is beige. Even the sky outside looks washed out, like someone bleached its surface. Supposedly, she went to Columbia, says Greg. But she's homeless, I say. Yeah, well, legend has it that she majored in English there, that she was brilliant before she became crazy and homeless and started begging on the corner for money. Greg sighs. Sucks, he says. Then he opens another spreadsheet on his screen and types a few more numbers. After work, I am back by Kent Hall. Now I feel more comfortable. I have a purpose, a reason why I linger around the Columbia campus, a reason other than Bobby. I have a viable, oops. <laughs> now if she sees me here and becomes suspicious, I have a viable explanation that does not involve her, the poetry lady. I listen to her closely while I wait for Bobby to exit Philosophy Hall. She chants poetry nonstop. Some seem original. Others are a botched melange of Shakespeare and maybe another language. She says these poems with conviction, like they will change something. Occasionally, someone will give her loose change, maybe even a dollar. But other than that, nothing changes. I find it hard to believe that the poetry lady went to Columbia, despite the fact that she projects and has good posture, two signs of a solid education. People may say she loiters around the campus consumed with nostalgia for the time before she went nuts, but I think she hangs around here because that's where the money is. Professors, admissions officers, university staff, they've got at least a little money to spare. And college kids hate having loose change. That night, I determined that cold milk with vanilla syrup does not taste as good as hot milk with vanilla syrup. I feel like I am wasting time. My shrink is a waste of time. Waiting on the Columbia campus for Bobby Garrity is a waste of time. It has been a week now, and I haven't seen her at all. I'm beginning to wonder if she sleeps in her office, or if she doesn't exist at all, if I'm dreaming up the plaque I saw on the wall. Either way, I now know the poetry lady better than I know my ex-wife. Ex-wife. That doesn't sound right. I don't even know what to call her. Former girlfriend, crush, obsession, stranger? Essentially, I'm stalking a stranger. My other ex-wife, the real ex-wife, is a waste of time, too. She still wants the record collection, says her lawyer. The four of us, my lawyer, Carol's lawyer, Carol and I, sit at a polished mahogany table in the law firm office midtown. Through the window, I can see the flat gray facade of another building. They gave us a room with a view. She can't say that herself, I ask. I look at Carol. She must have gotten a haircut. It is chopped in a straight line above her shoulders. I liked it long. You need your lawyer to ask my lawyer to ask me for my record collection? She does not respond. She does not make eye contact. This is how it goes for the next hour. Her lawyer asks my lawyer, who asks me, for the oriental rug we bought in Connecticut, the antique lamp that used to be on our dresser, the painting we bought together in Paris, the bed frame, the mattress. We are arguing over a mattress. The next day, there is a manila envelope under my door. Divorce papers. I would like to think that Carol wanted to at least give them to me in person, that she knocked and I didn't hear her because I was asleep. But I know this isn't true. I know she left them there and walked away. I open my refrigerator, but there is nothing inside except an old apple, two pieces of Swiss cheese, and milk. I sit on the window ledge, one piece of cheese in each hand. I need to buy furniture. Outside, the sun is full and strong. I can feel it through my window. People are walking slowly, especially for New York. I wonder what I would do today if I were still with Carol. We could make a picnic and eat it under the shade of a maple tree in Central Park. We could go for a walk around Soho, window shop, grab coffee at a place we've never heard of. We could go to the top of the Empire State Building and take cheesy photos of us kissing against the skyline. I look at the manila envelope, still on the floor. Carol and I never made picnics or went to Central Park. We never went for long walks or grabbed coffee. We never took cheesy pictures. We never really kissed. I walk over toward the door and pick up the envelope. And then, without looking at what anything says, I sign. I decide to walk to Columbia today, despite the heat. 
It takes me a half an hour, and I'm dripping with sweat by the time I arrive at Kent Hall, my usual post. Everything is as it always is. Kids running across campus, shouting to friends, smoking cigarettes outside buildings, lying on blankets underneath trees. The poetry lady, sitting straight back on the corner, chanting her poems. I begin my routine. For hours, I watch students and professors enter and exit Philosophy Hall. I'm beginning to recognize them, learn who is in what course at what time. I wonder if people have begun to notice me, to think that I am like the poetry lady, a campus staple, a crazy person who thinks he belongs. Excuse me, says a deep voice. I turn and see a middle-aged man in a suit. He is tall, with dark combed hair and thin lips. I'm meeting someone in Philosophy Hall. Do you know where that is? I point toward the building. Thanks, says the man, and I watch him climb the steps. The man said he's meeting someone. What if he's meeting Bobby? I lean against the rough brick of Kent Hall and wipe sweat from my forehead. Just because Bobby is not married does not mean she isn't seeing someone. Or maybe she is married and simply keeps her maiden name. Maybe that man is her husband. I do not understand how I overlook these possibilities, how I assume she was available. I no longer know what I am doing here. All of my assumptions could be wrong. I look at the poetry lady. She is proclaiming some sort of statement about weeds and greed. Maybe she did go to Columbia. I suddenly feel ashamed. It is naive of me to think that smart people don't go crazy, that just because you are educated, you are sane, and stay sane for the rest of your life. Sometimes people you'd never expect live under vast amounts of pressure. I stare at her, shaking her fist in the air. I imagine her as a student here, rushing to get ready for class, for Shakespeare, or modern British poetry, or American novels of the 20th century, and running to the coffee house on Broadway with a pile of books in her arms. It is sadder to think of her this way, as someone who lost something rather than someone who never had anything to begin with. I am hot and I feel faint. I need something cold. As I enter the coffee shop, I think of the poetry lady in her long skirt, long sleeve top, and red and blue plaid blanket. I order two iced coffees. Milk with vanilla syrup is no longer sufficient. I exit the coffee shop and approach the poetry lady. In the two weeks I have been here, I have never spoken to her. Here you go, I say, and extend my arm to offer her a drink. The poetry lady looks up at me with creased bug eyes. She extends one arm from beneath her blanket, takes the cup, and throws it at my feet. The coffee splatters on the sidewalk, my shoes, the bottoms of my pants. What the fuck am I going to do with a cup of coffee, she yells. I watch her suck in her cheeks as if she's going to spit at me, so I walk away fast toward Broadway. As I wait for the light to change, I hear the poetry lady belting out another poem or sonnet or song. Once I am able to cross the road, I do so without looking back. Instead, I stare at my feet and think of how I am lucky the coffee was iced. She is right, the poetry lady. She has no use for a cup of coffee. I do not know what I was thinking. Our next reader is April Davila. In addition to her fiction, April is also a travel writer with a passion for the desert. In writing her first novel, she spent a great deal of time in the Mojave Desert learning more than she ever meant to about ostriches. The title of her novel is The Feathered Tale of Tallulah Jones. Um, and she does write a great deal about the Mojave Desert, and I especially appreciated the passages about Las Vegas, because I'm from Las Vegas, and so I was really interested in your descriptions, and this one I particularly liked. Um, it was after midnight, and the streets were flooded with people. I realized it was Friday. This was the Vegas everyone always talked about. The women wore skirts of every color and shiny high heels that caught the reflection of the lights that blinked all around them. The men never noticed their surroundings for the short skirts. Some held long plastic tubes with straws poking out of the top as they navigated the haze of cigarette smoke in the air. It was frenetic. My Vegas had always been dominated by the blinding midday sun as it reflected off the parking lots outside the delivery doors in back of the casinos. Cooks, managers, and the occasional waitress passed through the kitchen while I struggled to make deals or keep clients. Vegas at night was a whole different place. And throughout the novel, she, she writes so um, tenderly and interestingly about place, and that's in addition to this amazing story of Tallulah Jones. So please join me in welcoming April Tavila. I'm 
so glad you like it. You're the first person actually from Vegas to read that, so I'm glad you liked it. Thank you. So I'm just going to read the first chapter of this. It is my thesis project, and it's called The Feathered Tale of Tallulah Jones. Um, and this is long before she goes to Vegas. So, <clears throat> all right. I figured they had a sorry. I figured they had an hour head start. That wasn't much in the harsh light of the Mojave in July. I could still catch up. With Grandpa Hank's old double barrel shotgun in hand, I pushed the strap of a full canteen over my shoulder and stepped out into the early morning. My boots knocked on the wood of the front porch. I shielded my eyes against the fresh daylight to look along the fence of the corral, which stretched out before me. When the door fell shut behind me, the ostriches inside the enclosure raised their heads to stare. The monotonous landscape of soft sands rolled out to the horizon, speckled by sage and creosote. The view was ripped down the middle by a dark path of churned sand that led west out into the desert. I pulled the brim of my weathered cowboy hat snug into place to protect me from the brutal sun as I stormed off the porch in the direction of the sloppy path left behind by the poachers. The thermometer hanging on the door of the barn seemed to sag and surrender, its dial already a notch above 90 degrees. I hurried along the length of the corral. On the other side of the fence, one of the ostriches, a female, blinked her big round eyes and fell into step beside me. With graceful strides, she easily matched my pace. Others joined her to form a mass of fumbled feathers and long meaty legs. They followed me to the end of the corral where I continued on, and they butted up against the wire grid, craning their spindly necks to watch me go. The path chased over the hill, a mess of kicked up sand that slowly took on an orderly pattern to reveal the clearly outlined two-toed footprint of one of my birds, the edge crisp in the thin crust of hard, smooth desert. Next to it, the mark of a cowboy boot sunk much deeper and about a third longer than mine. Whoever laid these tracks had 50 pounds on me easy. I, figured the next, I fingered the extra shotgun shells in my pocket with a shaky hand and forced myself to keep moving. The dusty, hot air burned my nostrils. Sweat collected on my skin. The wind creaked in the branches of the brush and made me check over my shoulder again and again, sure each time that I'd been snuck up on. The sun pulled itself clear of the horizon and dragged the temperature up with it. The gun hung, hung heavy and reassuring in my hand. Truthfully, I'd only ever shot at my uncle's empty beer cans, but I was ready. Whoever I was up against would have to take me seriously if I had a shotgun pointed at his chest. There was no way this bastard would get away with my bird. I came over a small hill and stopped. The desert stretched out in every direction, an undulating sea of sand, and in a sunken spot fifty feet ahead I saw a dark man with thick shoulders hunched in the bed of a dirty black pickup truck. He pulled with all his strength on the rope tied to the neck of my bird. Her mottled gray feathers fluffed in protest. The, the rope yanked her jaw forward. I dropped behind a white fur sage and peered through the thick branches. He loosened his hold on the leash for a moment and stood to wipe the sweat from his brow. Eddie Martinez. As senior at Victorville High in my freshman year, I still remembered the bloodied faces of the kids who hadn't relinquished their lunch money fast enough. Aside from a beer belly and a pathetic attempt at a mustache, he hadn't changed much. His thick, dark arms shook as he pulled again on the rope. The ostrich's neck bowed forward into the bed, her feet skidded in resistance. A thirty-eight pistol rested on the cab of the trek. I guessed Eddie planned to pull her into the bed before he shot her so as to save himself the trouble of hefting three hundred pounds of dead weight by himself. He was lazy, not stupid. Never did a bit of work he could avoid, and a full-grown ostrich could buy a lot of pizza and beer. Anger welled up, mixed with the fear already strong inside of me, and made every hair in my body stand up. As quietly as the wind over the sand, I slid the safety of Grandpa Hank's shotgun. Um, I decided to shoot in the general direction of the crook. If I got lucky, he might figure himself outnumbered, make a run for it, and leave the bird behind. I aimed far to the front of the, front of the truck and wished I had more shells. The bird squawked at him. She clearly had no interest in climbing into the bed of the truck, and when an animal that big makes up its mind, brute force will do you little good. Eddie cursed. He stood for a moment, then lashed out with his fist and clocked the bird in the eye. I hopped to my feet without a thought. That's my bird, I yelled and raised the shotgun. I slide-stepped halfway down the hill's head until Eddie and I stood eye to eye. Hit her again and I'll kill you. I swallowed hard, cocked the heavy hammer on the old shotgun, and took aim at his belt buckle. The bird shook her feathers and batted her long eyelashes a few times. Eddie lowered his fist, but kept a hold on the rope and leered at me with a deep squint. Shit, Tallulah, he said in a thick Spanish accent the kids at school used to tease him for. You know gonna shoot no one. I met his stare and did my best to appear calm so as not to confirm his suspicion. My mouth went dry and sticky with the metallic taste of adrenaline. You're right, I finally said, and swung the barrel of the gun to point it at the front tire of his truck. But the only thing between you and the highway is my farm. Walking around's what, five miles? 
Eddie shifted his line of sight to the horizon, his smug smile replaced by a blank, calculating stare. You bring enough water for a hike like that in this heat? I asked. The flopping in my stomach subsided a little when I saw a flash of res resignation on his face. He cursed again, looked from me to the horizon, then to the ostrich at the end of his rope. With a few reluctant steps, he moved toward the edge of the lowered gate and landed like a cement pylon in the sand next to my bird. Just get in your truck and leave, I said, and hoped he couldn't hear the shake in my voice. Eddie glared at me with his dark eyes from under his thick black eyebrows. Then, the bird in tow, he stomped up the last few feet to, of the slope toward me. As he came closer, I got a better sense of his size. Slick, hot sweat invaded the space between my palms and the smooth surface of the gun. Sorry. Um, and the smooth surface of the gun as I pointed it square at his chest. He charged right up to the end of the barrel and stepped so that the muzzle pressed against the fabric of his worn black t-shirt. I could smell anger coming off him like bird shit baking in the desert sun. He laid at the end of the rope over the barrel gun where it hung limp and white against the black metal. I let it dangle there, afraid to take my hand from the gun. Eddie's nostrils flared. I stared at the spot on his chest where the end of the barrel pressed against his shirt. A small well of shadow grew and shrunk with his rapid breath. Even downhill on the dune, he stood a good four inches taller than me. It took all my focus to keep my finger relaxed on the trigger when every other part of my body felt tight as a fist. In a flash, he grabbed for the gun, but his hands must have been sweaty, too, because the grab became more of a slap that knocked the gun to the side. I clutched at it and managed to keep it in hand, though it slipped and made my grip awkward. He pressed his weight in toward me, and I felt his sweaty t-shirt against my face as he circled my head with his thick forearm and grabbed a fistful of my hair. With the smell of him suffocating me, I slammed my knee up into his crotch. He yelled out in pain and threw me by my hair into the sand. I scrambled away and struggled to regain my grasp on the gun. Eddie wound up his arm for a backhand swing at me. In slow motion, his thick hand came at my face. I whipped the gun between us in a desperate attempt to deflect his blow and flinched. I felt my finger slip past the trigger guard and land squarely on the matched stick of metal beneath it. A quiet click disappeared in the explosion of the shot. The gun recoiled into the earth beside me and a spray of blood filled the air. A sound, difficult to discern at first, welled up from deep inside Eddie, a gasp that morphed slowly into a scream. It vibrated the air and filled the space left behind by the echo of the blast. The bird bolted. Eddie's voice cracked and his scream stuttered out. His eyes bulged in disbelief at the blood that poured down his arm. We were both stunned to see that the ring and pinky fingers were gone from his right hand. What remained was a bloody mangled mess with bone pieces and torn flesh jumbled against his remaining fingers. He slapped his good hand over the wound and flashed his, his stare at me. His lips pulled into a grimace and exposed all of his teeth. Afraid he might charge me, I fumbled to cock the shotgun again and pushed with my feet and pushed with, pushed with my feet until my back pressed into a sagebrush. I couldn't scoot away any further without taking my eyes off Eddie. He sucked air through his clenched jaw. A torrent of Spanish curses poured from his mouth as he pulled a bandana from his pocket to wrap the wound, but it soaked through in seconds. He stumbled to the truck and threw himself into the bed. His weight jostled the truck, and a dart of sunlight bounced off the thirty-eight pistol as he reached for it. Panic gripped me. I kicked and clawed at the ground and scrambled up the side of the dune. Behind me, I heard the scrape of metal on metal as Eddie tried to maneuver the gun with his left hand. I threw myself over the top of the f and flattened myself on the other side of the shallow ridge. I heard the shot. A patch of sand exploded above me. I knew I should run. I tried to, but my legs shook so violently that I fell on the ground. On the other side of the ridge, I heard the shocks of the truck squeak as Eddie jumped from the gate. I tried again, and this time found my feet. The shotgun threw me off balance. I tripped, reached the bottom of the dune, and grabbed a branch to help me up the other side. The sound of Eddie's truck growling to life snapped at my heels. It would be crazy to try to follow me over the dune in a pickup, but the morning's events shifted the line of sanity like the sand around my boots. The truck rumbled and then faded away. Medical attention must have outweighed revenge in his mind, at least for the time being. I stopped mid-climb and sunk low to sit for a moment. I felt along the shaft of the gun, found the safety, and engaged it. My fingers tingled, and an ache in my chest reminded me to breathe. I opened my mouth wide and sucked in a hot breath. My muscles relaxed, and my hands shook a little less violently. I needed to find my bird and go home. Odds were Eddie would go to the hospital, but sure as the sun would sink in the west, he'd be back. Such a great protagonist. Um, uh, our, our next reader is, is Laura Sari, um, who's graduating with a degree in fiction. And um, she's a journalist um, who uh, has been trying to let go of the truth in order to find it in fiction. 
She's a columnist and contributing editor for Orange Coast Magazine, which is a sister publication to Los Angeles Magazine. And she also worked for more than 15 years for the Orange County Register, where she won many national feature writing awards. Her work has also appeared in the Washington Post, the Huffington Post, the LA Times, the Chicago Tribune, and several other national publications. And um, her novel, Motel Girl, is uh, so delightful. And I just wanted to read this, this passage. Uh, I grew up in room 203 of the Westward Ho Motel. The Westward Ho was a pay-by-the-week rat trap across the street from Disneyland. Hi, I'm just reading your intro. <laughs> That's OK. There were, I'm just reading from your, your, your novel. Uh, I grew up in room 203 of the Westward Ho Motel. The Westward Ho was a pay-by-the-week rat trap across the street from Disneyland. There were dozens of drive-up motels like ours at the edges of the park. When they opened in the 1950s, my mom said the motels were deluxe. People would drive their big boats, she said, all the way to places like the Westward Ho, and they could park right outside their rooms. The cards were so grand they were part of the view. The motels up and down Catella Avenue had fairy tale themes and neon characters out front. Sometimes the characters moved, the Paul Bunyan chopping a log, the Rip Van Winkle blowing smoke rings, but most of them stopped running by the time we moved in. Our motel had its own come on, a covered wagon. In the heydays, rich kids from Chicago to Cheyenne probably scrambled under the bonnet and shouted, California or bust, like pioneers of the frontier. But by the time I lived there, the wood grain paint on the buckboard was peeling away to expose gashes of white plastic. The cart listed to the left, one wheel sunken into the ground as if it had gotten stuck in the mud without ever reaching the promised land. And that kind of lilt and cadence and, and uh, 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 just sort of word coining goes throughout the novel. It's beautifully written. And um, I also wanted to let you know, Laura, that Judith Freeman's in Idaho, but she sends her congratulations. And please join me in welcoming Laura Sari. I just want to say that um, this doesn't happen in a vacuum, coming and being able to do a program like this. And I get emotional every time I talk about it. My family is here in the back row, and I just want to say thank you for allowing this. It was a wonderful experience. So we're joining Ivory now, the girl in the motel, when she's nine. Um, and it is an adult voice in the novel. It's, it's the adult Ivory looking back on her childhood in the motel, kind of a meth motel across from Disneyland in the, in the 1980s. <clears throat> so I, I wanted to keep it under 10 minutes. So when I go like that, I'm sort of just taking out a section in case you're missing pieces. My mom and I stared at the television screen, hypnotized by the seven dwarfs marching backwards. They slid out the door of the cottage and across a bridge until they were sucked through an invisible rupture into a void. I loved Rewind with the picture still on, the story fluttering by soundlessly, the movements broken down into flickering sketches, the magic revealed. Hi-ho! Music blasted too loudly out of the set and my mom dived to turn it down. We were three weeks late on the rent, no sense making trouble with the neighbors. I'm going to grab a quick shower then, she said. Just, I could feel my lower lip quiver. She'd been having these little explosions all afternoon. When I got home from school and forgot to do my chores, she'd swiped her arm across the top of the dresser just to knock everything off. She was in one of her moods. But she'd promised to watch the movie with me. She made a Sorensen promise. Instead, she was locking herself in the bathroom, and if I knew my mom, she was going to be in there a little while. My dad called it squatter's rights. She stood with her hands on her hips. What now? Just, my voice came out in a squeak. My supper? You're almost 10. You're old enough to start getting it yourself, don't you think? 
She was always mad lately. Either that or she was happy. Crazy happy. Climb on the roof to watch the fireworks happy. Toss a coin to see where we're going happy. Best part about happy was the shopping. She'd rummage through my dad's pockets for change and drag me to the dollar store to buy neon shoe boxes of old can or old cans of hearts of palm or greasy white face cream or a plastic figurine of Guadalupe. Looking back, I realized how similar her angry periods were to her happy ones. When she was angry, it had the same quality of crazed acquisition, except instead of shopping for things, she collected li lists of wrongs. Today, I can see that she must have been bipolar. They were incredible mood levelers now. I sold one of them. I'd never seen our refrigerator so empty. Even the ketchup was gone. I'd sucked it dry the week before for the sugar. My mom spoke into the white cave, her voice echoing. When did we run out of milk? When did we run out of everything more like it? The checks were still five days away. A week had passed since I shook out the last marbles of milk from the carton. My mom handed me a bowl of dry cereal, and I stirred the spoon around just in case any moths were trapped in it. On the television screen, the dwarves were sh shocked to find Snow White sleeping. My mom sat beside me on the bed. Wouldn't it be fun to have a little house like that? You always say that. Every time it comes to this part, you say that. She threaded her finger under a hank of my bangs. I was trying to grow them out, and lately they were always getting in my eyes. This time it's true. You'll see. Your daddy's going to be on the radio. She smiled radiantly like she was already Mrs. Country Western Heart for all of the year. Your daddy's going to buy you all the houses you want someday. I only need one, Ma. One is all. It'll be, her eyes widen, a big one with a swimming pool, trees to climb, just like that forest she looked at the movie, and birds. Oh, would you look at those cute little bluebirds, Ivory? We'll have bluebirds. I started to cry. I don't know. I guess I was just tired. I'd never seen bluebirds in real life before, and I didn't believe my mom they even existed. She sat there with her arms around me, rocking me. I was too big for her to take me on her lap. You believe it, Mama? I said into her chest. Do you really believe it's going to happen this time? I could feel her rib cage sink below my cheek. This summer, sweet pea, you'll see. She lived for summer, with her pink frosted nails and her gauzy dresses, her blonde streaked hair and her cravings for ice cream on the coldest nights of the year. She would brought me up to expect everything in summer, a car, a baby, a job, a house, and though many Junes came and Septembers went with no car, baby, job, or house, I waited for them every year because she never had any doubt. But I was nine, and I'd started to stop believing. For the first time, I began to doubt that a house of our own would ever come true. I pushed away from my mom and sat there, cramming my mouth with spoonfuls of stale cornflakes. She stood, patting my head. It's going to happen this time. You'll see. As soon as summer comes. She walked toward the bathroom, and I heard the door close hard. My blanket was getting old, forming pink little pimply balls all over it. I started rolling them under my fingers, trying to make them bigger. Soon I had a whole pile of pink balls. A stack of warnings stared back at me from my dresser. Notice to quit. They were the only things my mom hadn't thrown on the ground. The dresser was a grayish yellow like old hair, and the veneer was peeling off the drawers. But my mom called it blonde and Swedish modern, words I found so glamorous I fell in love with that dresser from the time I was four. My mom said if I minded my P's and Q's, I stood to inherit it someday. Usually I didn't mind keeping it clean. I actually liked it, but she had no idea how difficult it was to keep up. Everything collected there. Cigarette packs, rosary beads, molting powder puffs, bills that came in three different shades of overdue. Every day, there was a mess of something I had to find a space for. But it was worth it. In my mind, a neat room was what set us apart from all the other loser families at the motel. I lined up my little fleece balls and started flicking them at the orange notices. Take that notice to quit. My mom was taking too much time in the shower. Hurry, Mom! The prince is coming! So here we have about a two-page break. 
I swiveled my legs off the bed and aimed for my fuzzy slippers and scuffed through the shed to the bathroom. Ma? Silence droned in my ears. The refrigerator motor rattled. I knocked on the bathroom door. The water wasn't running. I flattened my ear against the door. Nothing. Mom? I found one of her bobby pins on the nightstand and wiggled it inside the hole in the knob. Something was wrong. She wasn't answering. Something wasn't right. Mom? The door wouldn't budge. I backed up and rammed my shoulder into it. The door slammed into my mom like she was a sandbag. She lay curled on the floor. Wake up, Mom. A thick yellow rubber band cinched her flesh above her elbow. I picked up the rubber to see if I could break the strap loose, but it snapped back tightly against her skin. Mom! Her head flopped like a broken doll as I tried to sit her up. She had a bruise on her forehead. I ran for the phone by the bed. No dial tone. The silence on the line had a beat. It was my own heart pounding. My neighbor's door was open, Mrs. Johnson sitting on the bed. Call the ambulance, I screamed. She OD? Mrs. Johnson reached for the phone. She's stroking? What? I don't know. She fell. It looks like she bumped her head. Had a break. In the bathroom, steam was gathering on the mirror. A dark lake stormed in the electric skillet. My mom lay there in the same blue blouse that had felt so warm and smelled so fresh when I lay my head against it on the bed minutes before. Suddenly, too many bodies crowded the room, cut off sentences. Who's going to take the rap? You going to take the rap? I kept getting pushed farther back out the door, losing my mom in the legs. Metallic tights, too bright, bare thighs, jeans, a hole not in the pocket by a wallet. I listened for the sirens. Where were the sirens? Mom! I fought my way through the legs in front of me. A girl in a nurse's outfit was straddling her, pumping her palms on my mom's chest. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. Not a nurse's outfit, a beauty parlor or a waitress. She lived in one of the rooms up front. That's right, she worked at the Del Taco. You guys gotta all get back, you gotta give me some room, she yelled. Three Mississippi, four Mississippi. Please, Mom, for me? Nothing. Please, Mom, please, for Daddy and me. The man. It sounded like that bird kid, little Jakey, yelling into the room. All of a sudden, there was a stampede to get out of there. Even the girl helping my mom stood up, leaving her on the floor and running out the door. Now I heard the sirens wailing louder. They were here. They were here. The firemen, they would save her. She was all right now. They were here. A siren ended in a burp outside the room. I threw my body over my mom. But it was like putting your arms around someone who doesn't want to be embraced. She didn't soften to my touch. A shiver sharpened the hairs on my arm. The cold shot inward like a shock. Suddenly I was cold all over, so cold. And my mother felt cold, too. I lay atop her frozen body, listening for a trickle under the snow, one pulse, one beat, one thump, one flutter, please just one breath of the summer that was my mother. I love you, Ma. Nothing. And our final reader today is Corey Madden. And Corey's actually graduating in the summer, so I have not yet read her thesis and can't torment her with reading it in front of her, as I did with her other readers today. But um, Corey comes to us uh, uh, from uh, uh, career in Los Angeles in theater, and um, her play Worth will be presented at Ensemble Studio Theater Los Angeles in their first look series this coming Sunday night. Her multimedia public artwork, Day for Night, was recently selected to be presented at the Glow Festival in Santa Monica in September 2010. She won a Rockefeller Map Grant in 2008 and Best Production of 2009 for her silent physical comedy, Rock, Paper, Scissors, which will be presented by Spiel Theater in Holland and Belgium in 2010. In 2009, she was an artist in residence at Occidental College and Montalvo Arts Center in Saratoga, California. And Corey writes 
plays and essays and short fiction. And I don't know what she'll be reading from today, but she'll tell you. But I did want to read you this description um, from her proposal for Day for Night. It's a, and it just will give you a taste of the, also the kind of student we have in our program. We have amazing fiction writers, as you heard from our first three readers. We have nonfiction, we have poetry, and we have writing for stage and screen. And um, so Corey has uh, uh, just been granted this, this, uh, uh, this proposal she wrote was given the go-ahead, so she's creating this project called Day for Night, a 12-hour visual and sound installation conceived and created um, by Corey, who will direct it, a composer, Bruno Locheron, who's in the audience today, and a designer, Keith Mitchell. Day for Night is a movie term, also known as American Night, and it refers to creating the illusion of night using filtered daylight. The installation Day for Night turns this concept on its head by creating and presenting a 12-hour scored film of an entire day, dawn till dusk, at Santa Monica Beach. Day for Night will capture the ephemeral and enduring qualities of the ocean and beach, including the people who pass through the Day for Night filming site. So this gives you an idea of the kind of work Corey does beside her fiction and her essays. Um, the installation site of Day for Night will resemble a drive-in movie theater with an 18 by 13 foot screen installed just above the high tide line and a 32 foot square grid including 16 LED illuminated posts demarcating the site. And it goes on from, from there, but it's a, a you know, complete somatic experience. Um, and so joining us now is Corey Madden. Please join me in welcoming Corey. It's been such a wonderful thing for me to come back to school. I was somebody who, um, I taught in, in programs, but I was somebody who in some ways didn't like going to school when I was younger. So to go back to school and have such a wonderful experience has been just great. Um, and, and because my work often is um, dramatic and is hard to read as a single person, I, I wrote something um, about a week ago. And I thought I would just read you something short. And I think it'll be clear uh, why I wrote it. Some women. Some women, whether gay or straight, single or divorced, partnered, married, or widowed, and 18, or 22, or 26, or 35, or 53, or 64, or 70, wives and mothers and girlfriends and sisters and aunts and lovers or just friends, who may also be volunteers or good citizens or innocent bystanders or perfect strangers, who work part-time or full-time or stay at home or telecommute or freelance or are tenured or unionized, teachers or lawyers, maids or accountants, business owners or bakers, seamstresses or sex workers, manicurists or nannies, whose mothers or fathers were Jewish or Catholic or Buddhist or born again or Muslim or agnostic, and also Asian, Armenian, African, Indian, Anglo, Latino or biracial and or transnational, who have lived in this country for 5, 10, 15 or 30 or 90 or 200 or more years, who are legal or illegal or naturalized or registered or not as democratic, republican, green, socialist, libertarian or undecided, are so busy before work, during lunch, after work, after dinner, on the weekends and late into the night with their to-do lists and errands to the post office, the bank, the library, the soccer field, the bookstore, the doctors, the vet, and then to Walmart or Target or Costco or Smart and Final to get the plunger, the bath mat, the envelopes, the sleeping bag with just a quick stop at Mobile, or Arco, or Shell, or for gas, or maybe gum, or mints, sugar-free or not, or diet something, or Starbucks for mocha, vanilla, hazelnut, frappuccino, or cappuccino, or yum-yum for coffee, and a cake, or raised, or filled donut, with or without sprinkles. But then right on to Ralph's, or Vaughn's, or Safeway, or Fresh and Easy, or Albertson's, or Stop and Shop to pick up milk and eggs, meat and vegetables, pasta and sauce, beer and wine, ice cream and chocolate syrup, and just one of 13 varieties of dill pickles. And then next door to Walgreens or Rite Aid or Reed's for multivitamins, greeting cards, lip balm, condoms, KY jelly, people, Cosmo, or the star, for syringes, alcohol swabs, cough drops, Kleenex, antidepressants, and a cane with a rubber tip. 
Then pick up the children, drop off FedEx, deliver flowers, rescue animals, check on neighbors, feed the homeless, plant trees, wire funds, refinance loans, file for bankruptcy or divorce or a restraining order, while still needing to wrap that birthday, anniversary, wedding, shower gift, or install new locks, or research burial plots, or headstones, or hospice, or colon, or breast, or cervical, or lung, or liver cancer, and still make that hair, nail, doctor, dentist appointment, and don't forget to subscribe, renew, contribute, donate. As soon as they can just put away the groceries, take out the garbage, recycle the empties, water the plants, pick up the toys, clear off the counter, and cook dinner. For themselves, their husband, and one, two, three, or more children, or stepchildren, or foster children, or for their partner, or their boyfriend, or a hot date, or a roommate, or their mother-in-law, or best friend, or brother, who is visiting from France, or El Paso, or El Salvador, or Alabama, or who may be living downstairs, or upstairs, or next door, or down the street, and is recovering from a breakup, an addiction, a bad fall, or was recently released from prison, or the army, or navy, or marines, and just needs to get back on his feet. And don't forget... Clear the table, load the dishwasher, sweep the crumbs, feed the dogs and the cats, pay the bills, return that call or the emails. Now play with the children, check their homework or give them baths or read to them or tuck them in or sew a button on or lay out clothes or pack lunches or backpacks or suitcases or write the list for the next day. Or go out again to spend an hour or more or less playing softball or soccer or tennis or swimming or walking or spinning or doing yoga or Pilates, but instead swing by the mall or the outlet to shop the sales for socks, pants, shirts, shoes, towels, sheets, couches, cookware, or solar panels before they have a moment to catch their breath or watch the news or put up their feet or have a glass of wine to get back to their needlepoint novel or poem or play or to even get in bed and watch TV or movies or read about houses or fashion or heaven or hell or recipes or composting or to have sex or not or to even realize just before falling asleep that they will have to remind us to give them a call or send flowers or a card or take them out for breakfast or brunch or lunch or dinner to thank them for being one of those women who mother us whether we call them mother or not. All right, and, and maybe we can just have Sarah and Corey and April and Laura come up and get a shot of you together. And, um, and also have uh, some more general applause. For <laughs> we didn't plan this greeting. It just came out this beautifully. So. In the middle, Brittany in the middle. Yay!